Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon. My name is Monica. I am with Saks Healthcare, and I will be your technical producer for today's webinar. We'll pause for just a moment while we allow everyone to enter the conference. Thank you for attending, and we'll be right with you. Okay, thank you all for attending. Again, my name is Monica Pika. I'm with Saks Healthcare, and I will be your technical producer for today's webinar. Firstly, on behalf of Philips and Saks Communications, we want to thank all of the frontline workers in our audience for your commitment and passion in helping us all through this difficult time. We truly are indebted to you, and from the bottom of our hearts, we thank you. I want to show our audience how to ask questions. And how you can send in questions throughout the webinar, and our speaker will try to answer as many questions at the end of the presentation. So to submit a question, type your question into the Q&A box on your screen and click Enter. If you have a technical issue, please type your question in the tech support box and click Enter. Our moderator is Jose Morales. Mr. Morales is a respiratory therapy supervisor at South Miami Hospital. In this capacity, Mr. Morales coordinates and plans all activities for respiratory services, pulmonary lab, and pulmonary rehab within the department and throughout the hospital. Additionally, he is a flight and transport respiratory therapist. Mr. Morales holds an academic position as an adjunct faculty at Miami-Dade College. Welcome, Jose. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Monica, for the very kind introduction, and I thank everybody for joining us on today's webinar. The title of today's webinar is Transitioning of Care from Hospital to Home, Reducing COPD Readmissions. Our speaker for today is Maureen Littner, and she's a colleague and friend of mine. Ms. Littner is currently the pulmonary disease coordinator at South Miami Hospital in Miami, Florida. She's also part of the Lung Health Outpatient Resource Center. In this role, Ms. Littner manages the pulmonary health of patients transitioning from hospital to home, as well as helping patients manage their diseases in their homes. She's also an active member of the AARC. She is a pulmonary disease and COPD educator. Ms. Littner was a finalist for the AARC National Respiratory Patient Advocacy Award. She has presented at several local and national meetings and has published abstracts in respiratory care. Our speaker has disclosed the following. He has no re relevant financial relationships. This activity has been approved for continuing education for respiratory therapists and nurses for one contact hour. This also has been supported by Philips. And at this time, I would like to turn over the presentation over to our speaker. Marine Littner. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. It's, it's an honor and privilege to be here today, and I'd like to thank Saks Healthcare and Philips for this opportunity. I'd like to also put out a shout to my colleagues at South Miami Hospital, who are my second family and team. They're the best pulmonary services department, and they're they are directed by my mentor of many years, Mickey Thompson. I want to thank our medical staff, especially our pulmonary physicians, nursing, ancillary, and administration for all their support. So let's begin. Our learning objectives today are to describe the clinical benefits of utilizing non-invasive ventilation for acute respiratory failure. I would like you all to understand and identify the value of using non-invasive ventilation for the treatment of acute respiratory failure, but also use a non-invasive ventilation for strategies in decreasing COPD readmission. We know with technology and new modes of ventilation, there are benefits and indications, and I'd like to share with you the benefits of AVAPS AE. Historically speaking, 
Non-invasive ventilation has been around for decades. It's even written in the Bible. It's even, and the Lord God formed man of dust on the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, life. Genesis 2, 7. On the historical timeline, you could see in the 30s and 50s, we had the polio epidemic in the United States and Europe. And we were utilizing the lung, the body boxes and the iron lungs. It wasn't until the 60s and 70s where I was even, the volume ventilators and IPBBs were, were, were introduced and ICUs were established. I trained as a student not to tell you my age, on those IPBB treatments. But with technology growth in the 80s and 90s, I'm going to show you how a non-invasive program can be profitable and how it can improve the quality of life in managing patients with respiratory failure. Non-invasive ventilation is widely used in the acute care setting for acute respiratory failure. And this is a de definition of respiratory failure. There are different severities of acute respiratory failure. And the therapeutic treatment for acute respiratory failure may depend on the severity. It's a good initial assessment skills that you all have as nursing and respiratory and physicians and healthcare providers that will help manage these patients with acute respiratory failure. The cause of acute respiratory failure we know is often reversible. Sometimes it's very mild cases. We simply only need to support them with oxygen, whether it be via nasal cannula or a high flow nasal cannula. But we also know that a mechanical ventilator can be life-saving. The goals of a mechanical ventilator, we know improve gas exchange, decrease worker breathing, and improve dyspnea. But an attractive alternative to provide ventilatory support and oxygen is non-invasive ventilation. It buys us time. And it also prevents the risks associated with the more invasive intervention. Other benefits of non-invasive ventilation is it still allows your patients to communicate with you. We know that we don't have to use as much sedation. It decreases our potential for ventilator-associated pneumonias and it improves the physiological effects, as we said, of a mechanical ventilator. I'd like to ch share with you how our journey began, and it actually goes back to 1996. I actually was the therapist working in an emergency room here at our facility when an 85-year-old gentleman came in in respiratory distress. Fire rescue brought him in. He was labored breathing, diaphoretic, and many of you have already seen that scenario before. At the time in the, in the mid-90s and late 90s, there was the pioneers back then, Dr. Hill, Dr. Maduri, Dr. Pollock, and Dr. Brokart were developing and, and documenting some good literature that were supporting bringing the sleep equipment into the, into the acute setting. So we were very fortunate to have some sleep devices in-house, and we, we had adjusted them appropriately to help support this gentleman. What was extra special with this case is that we were able to reverse his acute distress and buy this gentleman time. But even more so, he was one of our own. We bought, we bought this gentleman, who was one of our retired physicians, time to be with his family, we prevented his intubation, and we successfully did it by utilizing one of our sleep equipment. That opened up an opportunity. It brought us support from our physicians in the emergency room. Our medical director supported us. That initial case opened up a, case, a, a literature review. We, we made it respiratory driven, and we had administration involvement. We, support, we reviewed our cases of patients that were on mechanical ventilation, and it indicated that we had a prolonged length of stay and consumed a, a disproportionate amount of ICU resources. So it gave us an opportunity to make an overall improvement. We developed protocols that served as guidelines.
protocols, identify the patient, and help the therapist guide the patient through the titration of non-invasive ventilation. We ended up developing a flow diagram. And that flow diagram or algorithm helped with identifying the patients in acute respiratory failure, who was going to be included, and who was going to be excluded. And with exclusion, you all have to keep in mind, you always have relative and you have absolute exclusion. Sometimes those relatives are just as difficult because the patient may be too anxious, and anyone that has used non-invasive knows that. And then sometimes um, morbidly obese patients have had to go in that relative exclusion as well. Maintaining a patent airway, respiratory therapists are experts in that, you know, and overall good assessments. Following the MD guidelines were for initial application and titration was essential, and then monitor side effects. This is something special and unique to our facility. We made what we called a badge buddy. A badge buddy was a, a little badge that went behind the name badges. And then that way, the therapist had a quick reference that they, depending on the device that they had to do the setup on, they had a quick um, instruction as a review. It helped with competency, but we all stayed on the same line as far as understanding the goals of non-invasive ventilation. We knew the difference between what was I and E, you know, and what, what was our overall goal together was to prevent the intubation. We wanted to improve alveolar ventilation and overall drop our length of stay and our ICU admission. It was the commitment, the commitment that we had and the support we had from our medical director and our emergency room physicians, and the empowerment of our respiratory therapists to totally drive and implement this program. We had the availability from our administration to cohort these patients specifically on a step-down unit where the nursing were just as skilled and knowledgeable in help in managing these patients. Their competency in managing these chronic patients were essential just as much as the respiratory. This was a team approach. In three fiscal years, we substantiated, we're able to decrease our cost per case by over 55% and saved $11 million. And we were able to decrease our length of stay, which was our goal, by 47%. The savings were later brought and, and shared at our national convention as an abstract for the respiratory care in 2004. So across the continuum of care, we know non-invasive plays an important role in treating acute and chronic respiratory failure today. After the 90s and early into the 2000s, we had the rise of code rescues. Now we can be proactive and start non-invasive ventilation sooner than later in our hospitals. We can, we can use them on our med surge floors. We're now advancing into our SNFs and LTECs and hospices. We use non-invasive in the home and in rehabilitation. We all know that we're all faced with the healthcare challenges of chronic illness today and the CMS guidelines, the Affordable Care Act. We all are facing issues with penalties and 30-day readmission rates. As state, there, there are many stakeholders in helping to decrease healthcare costs and improve quality of care. And we, have, we as healthcare providers are, are one of those stakeholders, and we can make the difference. The prevalence of COPD is real. It is the third leading cause of death in the United States. And all of you that are listening, you can look at your state and see what the prevalence is in your own individual state. We know that 20% of COPD patients that are hospitalized today present or develop a hypercarbic respiratory failure, which is an indicator for an increased risk of death. Non-invasive ventilation can improve quality of life. We took measures in helping to improve and treat this patient population. We developed a multidisciplinary team. And a multidisciplinary team is what I think is one of the most successful things from our system. A COPD navigator's primary focus is to help as a liaison from hospital to home 
in that transition. They help educate the family, the caregivers, and the patient on symptom management. We have a respiratory therapist managing these patients. We, we're only as good as all of us together. Every individual here, the nurses, the social workers, palliative care, pharmacy, the data team, you must have a substantial data team or statistician that can help validate your numbers, especially if you wanted to share it with everyone else and do publication. Pulmonary rehab is essential, and this can help with these patients and decreasing readmissions as well. There's enough evidence base to support pulmonary rehabilitation. The DME companies that we work with provide us with a liaison. They have been instrumental in, we, in helping us keeping these patients home. They are experts in their own worlds as well. And then we open an outpatient lung resource center. What's the, we decided as a team that we wanted to apply for the Regulatory Joint Commission Disease Specific Certification. The Joint Commission Certification is a, it, requirements is actually six chapters long and 42 standards, but most importantly with that, you know, there's three things that I found very um, rewarding or it, we had to get the entire hospital competent in disease management. That was a little bit of a challenge, but we all worked together and nursing and respiratory together were able to successfully have all the med surge floors competent in managing the COPD illness. We had, uh, we developed four clinical measures and then we, we developed tools to help train these patients on how to be self-managing. The benefits are is that you really do reduce the variation in clinical processes. And once you successfully meet all the requirements, you are recognized as a gold seal of approval. We use the GOLD. The GOLD is a global initiative of chronic obstructive lung disease. The GOLD helps diagnose, manage, and prevent COPD. The GOLD treatment helps with the symptom management, progression, it, it maximizes their total function capacity. Most importantly, it helps improve the quality of life by reducing the respiratory symptoms. The GOLD recommends non-invasive ventilation. And this is why I'm going to pull the GOLD back, uh, why I'm talking about the GOLD. The GOLD is evidence-based, and non-invasive ventilation is fully supported by the GOLD as a recommendation for COPD population. With technology and the growth of technology comes some great new modalities. The right pressure and the right time for better patient comfort and more efficient ventilation. Average volume assured pressure support auto EPAP. Now what is that? That's a new mode of ventilation. When I talk to my colleagues, I like to tell them, you know, we went through a good 10 or 15 years transitioning our country from CPAP to bi-level. Now this is the latest and greatest modality that's out there, and it's making a difference on people's lives. We need to get this, this type of modality and other modalities very similar out there to each other and start it's sharing it with our patients and making the difference. It's a non-invasive mode that treats acute respiratory failure. It also maintains a patent airway, and it will treat obstructive sleep apnea as well. The benefits, it's an easier titration overall. The patients, it'll adjust with the patient's progression. In our area down here, we treat a lot of patients with neuromuscular disease. And this type of modality will adjust with that patient's needs. The nice thing about AVAPS AE is you set a desired tidal volume and it'll adjust the pressure support to get that average tidal volume delivered. Our first patient was in 2015. I bring this to attention because that revolving door with these COPD patients, we often see that. This, this lady actually had probably about six admissions within three months. We knew we had to make, we, we kept adjusting her BiPAP pressures and setting the backup rate and 
we couldn't get her comfortable. Once we were able to get her on AVAPS, we were successfully able to keep her out of the hospital till her end of life. We bought her a good nine more months, but we bought her nine months at home in, the, in her own house. It's not a cure for anyone, but it will improve quality of life for the majority of the patients. This is a busy screen and I don't expect any of you to be able to read it right now. But this is, a, uh, is the flow diagram that we keep as a resource in our COPD binders on all of our med surge units and, med and floors. In the next few slides, I'm gonna uh, go through what is our process for AVAPS AE. We have initial application and identification for ordering the equipment. As far as trialing the patient on the equipment, we work closely with our DMEs locally in having the equipment brought to us, and then we follow up with them at discharge. So how would you identify a patient for criteria of utilizing AVAPS AE? What we found most beneficial is that we're watching the multiple readmissions. We know who's coming in the hospital and who has a readmission, specifically for COPD or respiratory failure. If they typically, when someone comes into the emergency room, we're, you know, we're helping them in acute respiratory failure on non-invasive ventilation, but it may not be AVAPS right off the bat, it may be by level. As soon as we go up to the intensive care unit, it's often, you know, we can, we're trying to reverse that process. If we can't reverse that process, most likely the pulmonologist may ask, can we do the trial on the AVAPS? That's how we're doing our transition. We find we do a trial internally on our own devices. There are specific disease processes that ICD-10s that are indications for AVAPS AE. And on the screen, you'll see a few examples. I have used a few uh, AVAPS with my um, IPF patients. A few of them had pulmonary hypertension that uh, we actually set them up more on a palliative care side intervention to buy them time. You have to work, what my recommendations also, these are initial applications for initiating AVAPS AE. It's best, and I appreciate Philip's clinical specialist for their knowledge and expertise in helping train our team on utilizing this mode of ventilation. It's working with your clinical specialist that you're capable of setting initial recommending settings. Every case though is case specific. What we had to do here is we had to set up, and it doesn't matter what your EMR is in, at your facility, it's most important that whatever your ventilator or any of your non-invasive device that you have or you're using, it has to be built into the EMR. Physicians must have it easily accessible for ordering the mode, and it has to be able to be documented appropriately by the staff that's utilizing that device as well. So a build, you must work with your administration for the build and IT to help with that build. We made another buddy badge. The buddy badge supports the competency with the team as well, and it's a quick reference. It's not two settings like the old non-invasive modality. It has 10 settings, as you can see on the screen, but it's also a quick reference guide for their badge, you know, to have that badge as a quick setup. One of the, also another benefit of this particular device that we use here is that it has the capabilities of dual prescription. Dual prescription is great with non-invasive, when we use non-invasive ventilation on neuromuscular patients. We're capable of using mouthpiece ventilation during the day where they can huff and puff on that non-invasive mode. And then at the night time, they can rest on a different interface, possibly a full face mask. Hospital trials on AVAPS AE. We like to set the patient up. We try to get them adjusted and assessed appropriately to the right pressure, the right tidal volume. 
We monitor them and we educate them. Education is extremely important and it needs to start immediately. We, they need to understand why they're on that device. We educate the family for signs and symptoms of acute respiratory failure, caregivers, in the event that the patient is starting to get lethargic or needs to get placed back on their device. Typic, typical settings for this device, we, we talked about earlier, but what we like to do is we like to monitor the patients overnight if possible and prepare them if they, if they adjust well to AVAPs, we'll prepare them to get ready for home. We have to document clearly and we have to communicate with our physician too because sometimes this mode, it's a great mode, but sometimes this mode may not be the most appropriate mode and you all always have to keep that in mind. So the ventilator may have to be adjusted. There's very specific variations in setups from hospital to home. And on your screen, you see a few photos. In the top left photo, I want everyone to keep, keep in mind but that's, that's an internal setup. And then on the right side is the um, outside. And thank you for my DME that su supported me and provided me with this, this pic. What I'd like to show you here though, is that when I say there's a disconnect and we, it was our experience here that the circuit we use in the hospital is ventilated. The circuit that they use at home is non-ventilated. So the difference between hospital and home is in the interface. You must keep in mind that the interface at home is where the carbon dioxide is going to be expelling or being eliminated. There are some interfaces that are interfaces that are more advantageous than others. If I trialed the patient here and we resolved or reversed the acute respiratory failure, it's very important that when they bring in their home device, that we're getting the same results as well. That was one of our benefits of being able to work with our DME and having them provide the equipment prior to discharge so we can do a trial here. Our oxygen as well in our device at the hospital is provided with a 50 PSI oxygen tubing. Where at home, you could see on the bottom right side of your screen, we bleed in the oxygen in that little white port. So we're going from FiO2 dialed to a liters per minute. So that's a, there is a variation in that, and we want to make sure when the prescription goes home, the patient's on the right liter flow. The patients that are set up on AVAPS AE generally have already failed or have been trialed on BiPAP, and their severity, severity of their illness is pretty significant. And we must keep that in mind. They, a lot of them are O2 sensitive, so we want to make sure that the DMEs have the patients stabilized prior to discharge as they can do their continuum of care and their follow-ups at the home. In the center column, you'll see an expiratory swivel adapter, and you'll also see a port where we sometimes bleed oxygen. If, we are, if, we're, if we're unable to bring the home device in, we will titrate our own liters per minute by that simple device in the center. Measured outcomes, subjective and objective. So we do monitor the patient for their alertness and their comfort and that the interface is, is functioning to the, what where we wanted it to do. We check end tidal CO2. Sometimes we'll do a blood gas prior to discharge and we monitor the minute ventilation that it's effective to, to physiologically change this patient and, and make them comfortable to the appropriate desired. Social workers have an order in our EMR now. We had to build that as well. Make sure that you have that set up appropriately so that the doctors can have and facilitate the ordering system. Once we know that the patient is successfully ventilating on AVAPS AE, we start this process as soon as possible because it, social workers are instrumental in getting this set up and they work with our DMEs closely and our DMEs are capable of have to do the clearance for insurances. Documentation and supporting documentation, we all know, is a battle, but we know what, and the DMEs are the experts, again, in helping us manage this. Who can get uh, an AVAPS machine and who may have to just stay on bi-level ventilation? Best practices. 
I'm giving my kudos to my DME team because we couldn't do it without their help. And I appreciate everyone out there that's worked with us through the years. Our, bringing the device in they, sooner than later helps us decrease our length of stay. What we did here was we biannually met with our teams, our local DME teams, just to help facilitate this transition from hospital to home. We asked them what we needed from our end, and then we asked them to help support us from their end as well in making this transition happen. Education, education, education. I can never stress enough as far as educating the patient, family, and caregivers from that discharge process from hospital to home. We use callbacks. We use callbacks to, to help facilitate this care. The Outpatient Lung Resource Center was established to complement our Joint Commission COPD application. The Outpatient Lung Resource Center that we have here primarily works on education and symptom management. And we follow up patients that are discharged from the hospital. Our success and values, we, we want to improve the quality of life and our patient outcomes. We have successfully been able to decrease our length of stay. Our patient experience and our improved quality of care is what we have aimed for. We successfully were able to get our Joint Commission certification in September of 2018. And our Outpatient Lung Resource Center was able to publish two papers in regards to COPD readmission in 2018 and 2019. We have some wonderful nurse practitioners that work down there and other nurses. And it's supported by administration. The first year we, we immediately started decreasing our COPD population. We found that 50% of our patients do utilize this service you know, after discharge. And of that 50%, we are making an impact. We still have room for growth. Uh, this, and then we showed sustainability the following year. In 2019, we saved a $1.2 million by not having the COPD patients come, come back. We actually increased, we originally, we only did three DRGs, the COPD DRGs, but because of the Outpatient Lung Resource Center show and prof um, potential in helping decrease readmissions, we also added and increased other DRGs that had respiratory illnesses. We use that resource center to educate patients with acute respiratory failure as well. When I'm talking about proactive and reactive, early identification for improvement of quality of life, our physicians are getting to know the different modes of ventilation. Sometimes they may even start the ventilator and order the ventilator from their office, but utilize our resource center as the education as a follow-up. Our DMEs have an outpatient uh, care orchestrator, which does remote re monitoring, and they can report back to us on patients that are on these devices. And once again, like I said, we have our Outpatient Lung Resource Center as our resource as well. The American Thoracic Society and European Respiratory Society has evidence base and supports non-invasive ventilation for acute respiratory failure. COPD and cardiopulmonary edema is very well treated today and is supported by the American Thoracic Society and the European Respiratory Society. In closing, I'd like to wrap things up. I want to thank everyone for your time and your attention. This is a special subject to me. It's near and dear to my heart. I have dedicated a good 30 years of my life I cared for a patient for more than 28 years that was on non-invasive ventilation. And I just wanted to dedicate this to him and to all the other patients that we were able to make a difference in. I want everyone to know that by using the evidence base and using advanced technology, we all have the potential to, for cost savings and to make a quality impact to our patients. Thank you all, and once again, the students out there that are listening, if there's any students, you are 100% our future. I want to thank all the professors at the colleges for all your time and dedication. I want to thank all the respiratory and nursing out there during this pandemic, and, and the physicians especially for you know being our rocks. 
and guiding us through this. Thank you all, and I'd like to pass this back to Jose. Wow, thank you, Marine, for that most interesting and thought-provoking presentation. Excellent work. I would like to remind the audience how they could obtain their CE for this activity. Continuing education for respiratory and nursing has been approved for one contact hour. To obtain the CE credits, go to SACS, SACS testing, or SACSTesting.com backslash BO. You will need to register at the site, complete the evaluation, and upon the successful completion of that, you will be able to print out your certificate. Support for this educational activity has been provided by Philips. An archive on demand version will be available on better-outcomes.org. An email will be sent to all registrants when it is available. The on demand version will be accredited for nursing and respiratory therapists. Now, we're going to move on to our questions and answers. And also for our questions and answers, we have our medical director of the Lung Health Program at South Miami Hospital. Dr. Blank. With this, we'll start our questions and answers. Well, we have a lot of questions. Our uh, first question is from Tammy. How many COPD patients are readmitted after only being home for a few days? How will this help? Hello? Hello? Um, Maureen, do you have the, the data? Yeah, so so how a non-invasive program will help with patients that are um, just home in a few days is um, being proactive prior to them being discharged. Identifying these patients earlier in the hospital, what was the reason for this readmission? But also what, what also can help is the callbacks. You know, by having a um a resource or a COPD program at your at your facility may help facilitate decrease in that COPD readmission because often it could be something simple as a medication issue you have to find out what the root cause of that readmission is and by identifying the cause of that readmission you can make a difference at your facility Right. Uh, following on that, there is two components of that. The presentation was basically for severe respiratory failure and patients who are chronically very ill. And because of that, they need to have some su ventilatory support at home that will prevent them from decompensation and improve their quality of life, hopefully. The lung health program has created also uh, a system to avoid readmissions by uh, giving patients a call back within 24 to 48 hours after discharge to be sure that they understand their treatment and they have their medications. That way we have been able to find out lots of patients who are discharged on the wrong medications or have not been able to, to get them. And because of that, they're not compliant and frequently they com decompensate again and end up in the hospital. If possible, we'll bring them to see a nurse practitioner in the health and the lung health clinic uh, to try to reinforce their treatment. The importance here is that people, when they're in the hospital, they're scared, confused, and sick. And because of that, frequently they don't understand what they need to do when they go home. And that way we can oh. prevent readmissions. Okay. I have another question here. I think this one will be directed to Dr. Blank. Uh, Dr. Blank, the question is from Joe. Uh, he states, is uh, congestive heart failure contraindicated for AVAPS patients, or for the use of AVAPS, AVAPS, sorry. No, it's not. But you have to adjust the patient. You know, uh, most people with congestive heart failure don't need uh, mechanical ventilation at home. Um, there is a, uh, in patients with central sleep apnea, like chain stock ventilation, there was a study that showed 
that the use of of a mechanical ventilation, certain form of mechanical ventilation increase mortality. So most people with chronic heart failure, you know, they really don't need a ventilatory support at all. And they, there's no indication for AVAX for them at, uh, itself. But, okay. you know... Marina, I have a question for you, and it comes from uh, Nicholas. Has COPD Navigator become an official recognized certified position? What we did here at our hospital was we developed our own program as far as being a COPD Navigator. And we, we, we currently have eight hospitals in our, in our system, and then we offered this navigator position or COPD coordinator amongst our other facilities as well. Okay. Nationally, there uh, are some states that are utilizing uh, a COPD navigator. And then through the AARC, and uh, it is supported through the AARC and through some states being recognized. Okay. Next question. I have a question that, well, actually have two questions regarding mouthpiece. Uh, they're both, one is from Diana and one from Lisa. And when you initiate non-invasive, do you initially start the patient mouthpiece ventilation to give the patient immediate relief and give the RT time to fit with a well-fitting mask? Generally not. We haven't, um, but keep in mind, it depends on, every case is case specific. And you have a very good point there. When it's a neuromuscular patient and they're first being introduced to non-invasive ventilation, I highly recommend mouthpiece ventilation because it can help them subtly advance, go into that um, mode of ventilation. Um, I like to have, we, we were very successful um, with using mouthpiece ventilation here for patients with particular, particularly neuromuscular disease because they were able to um, use that device, the mouthpiece ventilation during the day and, and have, uh, um, have relief with that and, not, and, and then give their, um, their, their face or, you know, so you didn't, you didn't want any pressure sores or breakdowns either. So it gave them a break off of the, the mask and interface that they had to use at home. I have two, uh, a combination of two questions, one from Harold and one from Carol. They both involve the DMEs. Uh, the first one, the first part will be, how soon do you involve DMEs in providing the equipment in the hospital? And then the second part to that will be, are you getting any pushback from DME companies in providing AVAPS AE due to their reimbursement? The CMS has specific guidelines and criteria for many modes of ventilation. And the DMEs are the experts as far as the pushback. Most importantly, what we have to have is that the clinical documentation support the need for this device. Our physicians, our nurse practitioners, and our PAs all have to know what are the requirements and, and, and substantiate the, 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 the documentation to support the need for this device. Often the AVAPS AE mode is after they have already trialed or considered by level. I just wanted to let you know that our system is very supportive in the chronic disease management, especially with COPD that have comorbidities. Dr. Blank, I have a question for you. It's from Nicola. Has AVAPS been successfully used in sleep studies or acute asthmatics? No, 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 we, I don't, I'm not aware of any studies to use AVAPS on asthmatic and for sleep apnea, it's not indicated. Uh, basically, um, we use BiPAPs for sleep apnea. Yeah. So uh, I want to mention that AVAPS is a great way for patients to adjust to the ventilator but um, some patients 
uh, will need complete support, uh, more so in patients with neuromuscular disease, mm -hmm. and because they don't have a good ventilatory drive, and those patients will benefit from either a volume control vent or a pressure control vent to better uh, manage their, their respiratory failure. In acute asthma, I have no experience with that. We don't use it regularly. Uh, we most most of the time, we in, in patient with severe asthma, we start with non uh, with bypass in the hospital. I have another question, Doctor Blank, from Abedi. Do you recommend any anxiety meds and coaching to try to keep the patients from coming in with? Panic attacks. That's a very good question. You don't want to use anxiety medication in patients with COPD that are retaining CO2 because that can make it worse. And many patients with acute asthma, uh, with acute respiratory failure, are very anxious because they, they're short of breath. What happens is that when you you adjust the ventilator to them appropriately and they feel the relief, you see them how they relax and, and go to sleep. If, uh, and allow the ventilator to, to manage their, their respiratory work. So if, here is, uh, there are some people who are so anxious that they won't tolerate any device on their faces and that makes things more complicated. In the hospital, if you are in a monitor area, like an ICU, you could try some, some short-acting uh, IV medications like Presidex to try to relax them and allow them to tolerate the ventilator better. But for the long term at home, it's very dangerous because people can, uh, and take too much and and become you know a, a chronic a, her chronic their chronic respiratory acidosis can become severe and and they could develop a respiratory failure and even die so I won't recommend it. Uh, Marina, I have a question from Sharon, and it's a very interesting question. Uh, when patient is when a patient is successfully with AVAPS in the hospital and is trans and is and I'm sorry and is transitioning on Medicare, it is necessary. Is it necessary to go through the trial of BiPAP according to the LCD? What is that process? A lot of it. From my, go ahead, Doctor Blank. Go ahead. No, no. From, from my understanding, is a uh, is harder. To give a patient with respiratory failure a BiPAP than a non-invasive ventilator tipo AVAPS, the type of AVAPS, right. because for BiPAP they always require a sleep study because in their in their I guess default BiPAPs are for sleep issues. So in the past we when before we had a non-invasive ventilators, we had to use BiPAPs at home for respiratory, chronic respiratory failure, and we were able to manage it that way. But today, every time you want to give somebody a BiPAP, you'll get a request for a sleep study. But for a patient with chronic respiratory failure, if you provide them with a non-invasive ventilator, uh, they, they don't require the sleep study, so it's simpler that way. And utilizing and, and working closely with your DMEs, they, they're the experts in these algorithms and the guidelines specific for the um, CMS. So they can help tell us what is needed to get this patient successfully out the door with these modes of ventilation. Um, often, you know, by level is needed to be um, trialed at least prior. Um, but we have, we can provide the clinical evidence on the inside prior to discharge if possible. Some of these patients are very frail, and they're unable, though, to go to these home sleep labs. Um, an alternative, and, an, and, and possibly even at the end of life, um, you could possibly offer um, a hospice, because some hospitals, hospices today are providing um, AVAPs, AE, at the end of life. And because patients 
and, and you don't have to go through all the hoops of going through um, getting sleep studies done. They're doing this and providing it as a medical necessity at their end of life. A question from Betty, and this will be geared for Dr. Blank and Marine. What do you suggest to help with the frequent flyers that come to the emergency room and what to be and want to be admitted for other, for other than shortness of breath? They do not meet admission criteria, but they get admitted. Yet we provide nothing more than they have access to at home. Uh, Dr. Black, I'll go real quick. So mm -hmm. most importantly with any chronic illness is identifying our, you know, case specific, what is that patient's need? You know, providing them with the appropriate resources. Possibly that patient may, may benefit from going to pulmonary rehab. Maybe they need to socialize more. You know, we know that you know, there's different issues and, and there's different comorbidities that these patients have. We might have to tap into other resources and, and call them, you know, in helping managing their, their chronic illness. We may have to tap into their families and get them involved, you know, and get them part of their care. Sometimes these patients, you know, lo no longer can manage themselves successfully in the home setting. And they may need to be, we might have to change and put them into a skilled nursing facility or a long-term facility. Dr. Blank. I agree with you completely. If you have to individualize and see what's going on with the patient, their fears, their loneliness, their misunderstanding of of, of their require what they need, and you know, by approaching that with a social worker and a nurse navigator, you'll be able to understand better what's going on and provide them what they need to stay home. And anxiety, depression is very real with this patient population, and that needs to be addressed as well. Another question here. Um, this question is from Patricia. What brands of non-invasive ventilators offer the modes of AVAPS AE? Are we only limited to the one you demonstrated? Yeah, there, there's many companies out there that have similar um, modes of ventilation. We have been very successful with the AVAPS AE because that's our gen that's our device that we use here. I have another question here from Robin. What is the liters per minute range for O2 bleed in on AVAPS AE? Can oxygen concentrator be utilized for the O2 bleed in? In the home setting? In the home setting, they're bleeding the oxygen in through a concentrator, most likely. I would like to add to Marine's uh, response, too. It all depends what the leader flow of the patient. It, it gets titrated down in the hospital before they uh, get sent home. That's why, as Marine stated in her uh, presentation, we usually have the DMEs bringing these machines into the hospital setting, so at least we can provide some guidance and some uh, visual inspection of the machine and then titrate them down to the lowest liter flow that we could possibly have them, uh, depending on their, of course, on their saturations, or, or we do a blood gas. And then that way we're capable of sending them home either on the O2 concentrators or O2 tanks, I mean, depending what they get approved for home use. And a common, Oh, I apologize. And a, co a common order for discharge may be one to three liters titrating saturations for 88 to 92. So the DME has a, a window that they can work with these patients and establish the FiO2 ne necessary for those patients in the home area. We know it's not the same at the hospital, but at least we can get them a safe range at discharge and we can get that patient at a comfortable mode prior to leaving. It also ties into a question that I see now from Tony. So we don't use the oxygen in line on the back of the trilogy in the hospital setting. We, in, we use the 50 PSI tubing 
connected to the ventilator in the hospital. And then in the home, they used the connecting oxygen tubing to that little white adapter I had shown on the photo and bleed that into their concentrator or oxygen from home. I have a question from Donna. Hi, just to clarify, I have never done home care. Have you been able to send patients home with a Trilogy vent to use as a BiPAP utilization AVAPS mode via a DME company? I'm, so, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, have you have you have you been able to send patients home with a trilogy vent to use as a BiPAP utilizing AVAPS mode via a DME company? I I'm not quite understanding the question, but what I what I believe you may be asking. So the the trilogy ventilator has multiple modes of ventilation available. AVAPS AE is just one of the various modes in that ventilator. We, that, that AVAPS AE can be used non-invasively and it can be used invasively. The Trilogy ventilator is approved for invasive and non-invasive ventilation. You have assist control modality in that ventilator as well. You can also do by level in that ventilator as well. That may be what you're asking. It depends on the mode necessary for that patient. We have, a, like Dr. Blank had mentioned before, we had had patients on AVAPS that we had to switch to assist control mode to better suit the patient's needs as far as ventilation. So every case will be case specific. But the, the good thing about the trilogy is that you have the capabilities of changing the modes necessary while the patient's on that. Okay, I believe we have time for just one last question, and this would be geared for Dr. Blank and Maureen, and it's from Dana. Any ideas on how to convince pulmonologists that the NIV is a good thing to use? <laughs> it's evidence-based. <laughs> it's a standard of care. It's been around since uh, decades. Non-invasive ventilation works. Well, we've been using Dr. it for Blank, years. Dr. I think, Blank, you know. Can we you, Dr. Blank? <laughs> <laughs> but the, the reality is non invasive ventilation, there's plenty of data that shows that it prevents intubation. You know, in an acute setting in the hospital, prevents intubation, decreased mortality, not only for COPD, but also for acute heart failure, asthma, and other causes of respiratory failure. It's not that good on patients who are with pneumonia who are developing uh, acute respiratory failure because those patients most likely will need to be intubated but will save you will buy you time if the new covid uh, infection we we've been we're not been used even though it's been used in europe uh, a lot but um uh, because of risk of aerosolization of particles and contamination of personnel. But non-invasive ventilation is great. In the case of chronic respiratory failure, it's, more, it's, it's, it's also evidence-based, and people with hypercarbonic respiratory failure do very well with non-invasive ventilation, being neuromuscular or COPD and they improve quality of life and improve uh, uh, many aspects of their their lives. So, you know, it's very well known. Probably to convince the people who are not convinced, you have to get the literature and give them to them and maybe more, uh, promote a discussion that way. Having the support of your well, medical staff and team is, is essential in any non-invasive program. And especially, like we said, during this COVID, those patients that are home already on non-invasive ventilation, it was our saving grace that they had the devices in their home setting at this particular time because we were able to sustain, uh, keep our hospitals open for the COVID patients. And we weren't using our other ventilators in the hospital for the non-COVID patients. They were already home at, at home on their non-invasive ventilators or non-invasive devices 
maintaining their ventilation comfortably in their own home setting. Well, thank you all for attending this uh, webinar. This concludes our questions and answers, and then I'll turn over the presentation to Monica. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that this does conclude our webinar for today. I'd like to remind the audience that there is a survey for you. And it uh, will pop up immediately, and we would greatly appreciate it for if you would fill that out. Well, your opinions are um, definitely appreciated. And we thank you again on behalf of our presenters, Sachs Healthcare Communications, and our sponsor, Philips. I do hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you so much.